your great grandfather played a great role. He was one of the few, the few police who was in the Dreyfus camp. So uh, you'll be probably happy to see your yes. grand yes, great yes, grandfather. Yes. So this snapshot is very uh, important because it's one of the rare snapshots we, we've got from the courtroom, you know. Here you have Dreyfus himself and the lawyers uh, defending Dreyfus. Uh, mm -hmm. And this man standing is your great grandfather, Celeste Aignan. Oh, yeah, yes. and, uh, That's amazing. Wow. Aignan was not only in charge of the, of the security, he, he became a very important witness during the, a the witness. trial. Yes. Have a look at this, yeah. on, uh, for instance. This is a New York, New York Times. Times. Yes. God, it's in the New My great grandfather was in the New York Times. Yes. So it says, it. oh, it's amazing. You never knew? No, I've got goosebumps all over my body. <laughs> Aignan helps Dreyfus's case. If you look at this other, uh, you will recognise, of course. The Times. <laughs> God, the Times, the New York Times. The, the Madrid Times and so on. Oh, Dreyfus trial. Aye, aye. Third page. Monsieur Aignan. Right. There's a whole paragraph. So Monsieur Aignan was called to the bar. He testified that he'd been ordered to find a man named Paul Mier. It had been reported that while he was in the service of a German officer attached to the German legation in Brussels, he had seen upon the table some directing plans signed Dreyfus. Paul Mier was found and declared that he'd never seen any plans and had never made the statement imputed to him. Incroyable. Celestin Aignan's role in the trial changed when he was summoned to take the stand. He testified that during the investigation, his officers had interrogated a prosecution witness who had allegedly made a statement implicating Dreyfus. On the stand, Aignan revealed that this witness had denied making any such statement. Enion's evidence bolstered suspicion that the first trial had been fixed and that Dreyfus had been falsely accused. I could tell you a small story. For the burial of Emile Zola, could you imagine the crowd? Yes. Hostile, like, shouting, Moro Juif, death to the Jews, and so on. And Enion. That's uh, written in the memories of Mathieu Dreyfus, the brother of uh, the Captain Dreyfus. Aignan went to Mathieu Dreyfus and told him, I will stay with you so the people will know in which camp I am. And that's very courageous at this time. You know, the Where more I, I know, the more I know him, um, the more he, I, he, I love him, he's, he's, he's a such very, a great guy. very, very, very interesting man, uh, in my opinion. But uh, it's good of. <laughs> uh, it's impossible not to, to to fall in love or to feel empathy uh, with, with a man like that, of course. Hello. Au revoir. It was a pleasure. <laughs> For me as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Au revoir. I just wish that I could have met Celestin. I mean, he seemed like a real man. He had all the qualities that you would want your perfect man to have. Loyalty, courage, integrity, um, ambition, strength of character, good looking, you know, just Lovely. I'd love to go and see where he's buried. Um, it seems like the final stop on my journey. Celestin Aignan died in March 1915. He's buried in the family tomb in Gomony, in northeast France. It's 
so quiet. There's no, there's no cars. There are no people. I had a little moment earlier on when I was walking, you know, and you have a bit of time to think. I had a mini moment where I thought, isn't it a shame that my mum isn't here to, to show her and to sort of share it with her? Because as much as we had our differences, I think she would have loved it. Really lovely. I think one of the nicest things I've found on this trip is that not only was he a great guy, but there seem to be lots of people that aren't even related to me that are intent on keeping his memory alive. And he's not a huge celebrity in France, but the people that love him really love him. <laughs> Having viewed my lives, I kind of describe them as my two lives, you know, as being totally separate and France was all such madness and England was always such security. I look at my ancestors and I think, you know, there are such great similarities between the two of them, you know, great principles, men of integrity, kind, love their families, upright. They even kind of look the same. So I'm not that split up. I am more of a whole person, I suppose, in a sense. And, you know, it's interesting, in both stories, people were saying to me, this is an ancestor to be proud of. And I'm proud of that.